open arms, always open arms. God's arms are always open to everyone, everyone, anyone, anywhere, any place, any time. It's amazing that on that cross, the arms of Jesus is really what God is saying from the beginning of Genesis. I've got open arms for you. No matter what situation that you're in, no matter how complicated your situation may be, there may be people who have a marriage that is completely convoluted. There are people who are in financial situations that are like a quagmire beneath a, beneath a, a mile of quicksand. There are people who have health issues that have been told by doctors, this is the best that we can do. Everyone is in a different situation. And yet God is silently, lovingly, with great compassion, with great eagerness, inviting everyone anyone, everywhere, open arms. And we welcome you again to the Christ Jesus College and Seminary, the world's only tuition-free Bible college and seminary. We're not about the money. We're about helping those who are called by God to help change the world with the good news. And it really is a seminary, not a cemetery. We're here to really make a difference. We don't, we're not, it's never been the vision of the college to have 15,000 students and to be ranked number one in the world as a seminary. I much rather be counted like a small seminary like Samuel had in the book of Samuel where he just had a handful of men who were really serious, a handful of women that were really serious about living for God, giving God all the glory, and really being obedient to the scriptures. The same with the chapel. Our chapel is not the Sistine Chapel, but it's a body of believers who really love Christ, we really love each other. And I just find it amazing how we've been growing by the grace of God on YouTube and now on other platforms. And I give all the glory to God. I really do. So here we are. We are now on the ninth chapter of John. And I'm, I will say this to you again. I feel like I've never read this book before. I'm seeing things I've never seen before. I hope you, if you feel the same way, please, by all means, say something in the chat to reconfirm that you're seeing things for the very first time. The last two chapters were raw. I mean, they were brutal. I mean, you see this discourse, this tension between Jesus and the, the high priest's you see Jesus' love coming down from the Mount of Olives to teach. He is so in touch with people. Jesus is all about people. Jesus is all about you. Jesus is all about me. Jesus is all about us. And there's so much distraction. There's so much confusion. There's so much misinformation. There's so much hatred you know, there's so much hatred in this world. There's so many problems. There's war, disease, there's theft, there's fraud, there's adultery, there's fornication. There is just so much wrong. There's so much evil. And yet Jesus, he clearly says that he's the light of the world. We're in a new chapter here. I think that we're going to read these, I believe it's seven verses. That's all we're going to do is seven verses today. But they're going to blow your mind. I was reading this last night in my devotional, and it, it, 
it took me down. It was like spiritual jujitsu, and it just took me down to the mat. I said, "Whoa, wow! I never saw that before. That this is really incredible." So let's ask God to be glorified through the name of Jesus. But let's pray that the Holy Spirit would enlighten us. And let's read these verses and have these verses actually speak to us. And me, just a pencil. I'm just a medium. I'm just a messenger. <laughs> the mailman, the mailman of God. And I'm very happy to, to deliver this message today for you. And as Jesus passed by, remember we had just now just if you if you've missed it, it's just a it's yesterday's episode and the episodes before, but it's been a very brutal, very honest. And we need to be real with ourselves that there are people that are going to die in their sins. There are people who are the children of the devil. This is a reality that we have to come to terms with. And Jesus minces no words. And if you haven't had a chance, I really encourage you to just dial back and start from chapter 1 or wherever God leads you. But some very, very, very sound doctrine that we need to review and to absorb and to assimilate, and make it part of the marrow of our bones. But now Jesus is now moving on. Jesus, he, he is walking and he passes by, and Jesus sees a man who was blind from birth. Now, let me tell you something. I don't care how much technology there is. You can talk to me about how much artificial intelligence there is. You can tell me all about the advances in medicine and surgery and neurosurgery and blah, blah, blah. It's, it's 2023. And man still cannot cure blindness. Most scientists can't even explain how the retina works, how a photon enters the pupil and strikes these very interesting layers of, of the retina, and how that's translated into some very vital information and changes from, from electrical to chemical and hormonal changes in the brain that is way beyond us. And so he sees someone who is blind, and this man has been blind from birth. It means the minute that he came out of his mother's womb, he was blind. Now his disciples, we're talking about Peter, James, John, Thomas, the whole lot of them. They're like perplexed. They, they see this man. And they've just heard the teaching of Jesus in these last two, three chapters. And so they say to him, Master, remember, in the Bible, it's very clear. We are not to call anyone Father except God. And we're not to call anyone Master. You know, I, I love the martial arts, but I have great reluctance calling someone Master Sensei or Master. That word master only belongs to God. It only belongs to Jesus. And so they correctly approach Jesus. And they're not calling him rabbi. They're calling him master. Maybe in your translation it says, it says rabbi, but in the King James it's master. And it says, who did sin? They're looking at this man. He, and you understand, this man is helpless, He's hopeless. He's never seen light. Hint, hint, wink, wink. I am the light of the world. He's never seen the blue skies. He's never seen the beauty of God. He has to depend on people to give him money. And he can't even take that money and go to a store and buy food. He is completely dependent. He's completely codependent on others to help him in every possible way. Think about it, going to the bathroom, eating bread, finding a, a safe place to stay for the evening. He's completely dependent upon others. It is, 
I can't even imagine. I have no verbs or adjectives to, to describe what it means to be living in the street. It's one thing to be homeless. But this man is utterly blind from birth. And there's no family around him. There's no Medicare. There's no Social Security. There's, no, there's nothing around this person to provide him support. So the disciples look at this person, and it is a human problem. It is a major human problem. And so they have a question. Did this man, did he sin? Or did his parents sin? What's the cause and effect here? How did this man get in this situation? Now, I learned a long time ago. If you ask the right question, you more than likely will get the right answer. The disciples here are definitely asking the wrong question. Oftentimes, we as Christians, we are asking the wrong questions. Why is this happening in the world today? Who's behind this? How can this be happening in the world today? How can this be happening in my community today? How can this be happening in my family today? How can this be happening in my life today? Well, there's there's, there's got to be a cause and effect. And then we use our human mind. We use our human reasoning. We use our, our carnal faculties and people are great at this. You can go to YouTube, and there's lots of theologians, lots of pastors, and so-called life coaches, and these clinical psychologists. So everyone's got an answer. Everybody's got an answer. And they just go off for a good 10, 15, 20 minutes. They sound so educated. They sound so intellectual. And they rattle on, and they know all the books, and they know all the theories, and they, they've got all the syntax and they're asking questions, but there are no solutions. So what is it, Jesus? Who sinned? Did this man sin or did his parents sin? Because obviously there's got to be a cause and effect. Now, Jesus is going to give them a response that's going to completely do a spiritual jujitsu and take them down to the mat. They're going to learn something here that's really come, that's going to go into effect when they go into the book of Acts. After the death of Jesus, after the resurrection of Jesus, and when Pentecost comes, they're going to learn from this experience to be just like Jesus. And isn't that what God wants you to be? Isn't what is, I mean, if you're really a Christian, I mean, if you're really a bona fide, born again, saved Christian, a new creation in Christ, and you're part of the family of God, God wants you right now to be acting like Jesus. Why fool yourself? That is God's expectation in your life. Did it ever dawn upon you? You know. Satan really played a really bad, he played a really bad game on Eve and Adam and the garden. And Eve gets a bad rap. But do you see what Jesus is doing? Jesus came down and he paid the penalty of sin for anyone who would come to him in faith. And he goes to heaven and he says, well, I started it, you finish it. Think about this. I started, the, I started the work. Now it's up to you. Yes, you to finish the work. And we are the body of Christ, but we're also the bride of Christ. Think about that for a moment. What kind of, what kind of message that, that, that's being sent to Satan and all his, all his, all his, all his flunkies? It's the bride of Christ. You fooled the first woman, but the second woman, my wife, you're not going to fool. You're not going to fool. She's going to get the job done. And Jesus answers now this question. And I think that if you really pay attention to how this 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 answer is 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 
relayed out. There's four parts to it. It's going to challenge you. It's going to challenge me. It's going to challenge us. Because maybe the church, maybe we as the body of Christ, we're asking the wrong questions. Maybe we're looking at life the wrong way. Maybe we're looking at our problems the wrong way. Maybe we're looking at everything the wrong way, and it's our perspective, it's our motive, it's our attitude, it's our questions that are wrong. And we and maybe we're just simply talking too much about it and not doing anything about it. Is that possible? Is it possible that we're talking too much when God wants us to be doing something about it? So the question is, who sinned? Did this man sin or did his parents sin? Because obviously, look, look at this horrible, critical human situation. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's beyond a catastrophe. Jesus answered, neither. You're asking the wrong question. Oftentimes, you're asking questions and so easy to judge other people. It's so it's so easy to intellectualize what's going wrong. And Jesus says, neither. Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but the works of God should be manifest in him. Whoa. Are you trying to tell me that every time that there's a problem... This is an opportunity for God to be glorified? Are you trying to tell me that every time I have a health issue, that's that's an opportunity for God to be glorified? Are you trying to tell me that every time there's a financial crisis in my life, that that's an opportunity for God to be glorified? Are you trying to tell me that every time that there's some kind of obstacle or delay or there's some person who's toxic in my life, and my prayers don't my prayers don't seem to be answered that that is an opportunity for god to manifest himself you got it that's exactly what jesus is saying jesus is saying here this has nothing to do with the man you know, maybe some bad people did some bad things to you. Maybe your family has betrayed you. Maybe your husband and wife have, have disappointed you. Maybe you have disappointed yourself. Sometimes the worst enemy is yourself. That isn't the question, nor is that the answer. What Jesus is saying here, that every time that there's a crisis or a problem, anywhere in the world, a community, in your family, in your life, in your mental life, in your spiritual life. This is an opportunity for the works of God to be made manifest. Let me put it another way. God is unlimited. The power of the Holy Ghost is unlimited. We have limited God. We have limited the Holy Spirit. We have limited Scripture. We have limited our minds. We have limited ourselves to the imponderables because we're asking the wrong questions. We're looking at everything the wrong way. Remember, God gave dominion to Adam over the earth. God wants us to be victorious. God wants us to be the apex of the triangle. Now look what Jesus says here. He says here, I must work the works of him that sent me. Is that our, is that our attitude? That I'm here in this life, and as, as long as I'm alive, I must be working the works of God because he sent me to do these works. I have something very uncouth to say. So don't shoot the messenger. I've been around. I've seen a lot of churches. I've met a lot of pastors. I've seen Christianity from, I guess, that helicopter that goes up high. And I take, I take a, a grandiose look of, of, the, of the bigger picture. The church is not doing. The church is talking. The church is not in the gym working out. 
the gym is not the, the rather the church is not fulfilling its complete purpose in God. He says, I must work the works of him that sent him while it is the day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Now, as long as the Holy Spirit is here on this earth, we are the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth. If anything goes wrong, if anything goes down, if anything is not right, the accountability is to the Christian. Let's be real about it. Because if Jesus is living inside, if God is living inside, then there is a power, there is a solution, there is a source of energy, there is a, a, a higher quotient. And the disciples are asking the wrong question. Jesus is saying this is an opportunity for God to be glorified. And I have work to do. And I have a limited time. You, my friends, us together as Christians, we have a limited time to do the works of God. There's going to come a time when the night comes that we will be unable to fully do the works of God. This is exactly what Jesus says. As long as I'm the light in the world, I am the light of the world. But the night cometh when no man can work. So we have limit, we have unlimited resources, but we have limited time. Is that is that is that the mindset of the church today? Is that the mindset of the Christian today? Is that your mindset that God has a special plan, special mission, special works for you to do, but you've got a you've got a time clock. You've got a limited amount of time. This is a great attitude to have. Now, Jesus does four things to answer this problem. He says he spat on the ground. This is extremely unusual. Theologians have, 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 have had insomnia over this question. Why couldn't Jesus just say, be healed? Open your eyeballs and be healed. He spat on the ground. Sometimes the solutions that God, that God is going to give us in the problems that are around us, that are in the world, that are in our life, are going to be unconventional. We do know that he makes, it, he makes it personal. This is the second time that we see Jesus touching the dirt. We can't be afraid to come down to the problem. He spits on the ground. People are going to be looking at you and saying, what the heck are you doing? But see, if you're living a life of faith, then how you live your life is going, to, is going to raise a lot of eyebrows, and it's going to make a lot of people question and say, you're weird. I, I don't get you. Congratulations. You're now in the Jesus Club. And it says he made clay out of spittle. God's way is not our ways. God's way is not our ways. He made clay of the spittle. And oftentimes God is going to ask you to do something unusual. You'll have your last dollar bill. And God will say, give that dollar bill to somebody else. I need that. I need to go to 7-Eleven to buy that hot dog. And God said, no. You're going to give that dollar away. And you're going to, you're going to watch and see how I'm going to replenish you because you're going to act in faith. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with clay. Now, this is going to be a little bit touchy. So I hope you see, hope you see seated. Maybe drinking coffee. Don't spill your coffee. Jesus decides to touch the man. When was the last time that someone touched the man? A lot of times we don't want to personally get involved in these kind of problems. Jesus decided to touch the man. You know, the, power, the power of touch is so powerful. And think about this. He didn't touch him on the hand. He didn't touch him on the shoulder. 
he touched them exactly where the pain is. And he began to rub very gently the spittle, the clay into his eye. You got to be thinking, what, what was this man thinking about? Like, what, what are you doing to me? All you have to do is put a couple of coins in my cup. You see, Jesus wants to touch you exactly where your pain is. Uh-oh. Me? Me have pain? Yes, we all have pain. We have very sensitive areas in our life that have been there for many, many, many years, bad memories, bad situations. We could be right now in a situation that is so painful that we cannot, we cannot even express it properly to our brothers and sisters. And Jesus is saying, I want to touch you exactly where it hurts. So here we have a human problem. It's a big problem. And we and many people want to become doers and thinkers and 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 maybe maybe ignore the problem or they want to plan plan how to solve this problem. And so we all face problems differently, but Jesus is deciding that he's going to touch the person where it hurts him. So his his response, the response of Jesus shows us how the best way that we can be humans, the best way that we can be Christians, is to get involved, to get close into to get close into it with each other. Jesus says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. He takes it further and says, love one another as I have loved you. This is our mandate. It's not a discussion. Too much discussion going on. People complaining, muttering, oh, everything's going downhill. It's going to get worse from here. I don't know what's going to happen. You know, it's the end of the world, you know. God wants you to make a decision. Stop being a discusser. Stop being a talker and be a doer. This is exactly what Jesus is doing. So he solves the problem. God wants you to solve the world's problems. So he re Jesus rejects the hypothetical questions of his disciples, and he gets to it. He goes, I have work to do. Excuse me, guys. I've got work to do. And you and I need to, to get away from the people who are the talkers, and we need to get busy doing what God wants us to do. Here are my final notes. Are you willing to uh, are you willing to allow Jesus to touch you where it hurts the most? It could be embarrassing. It brings attention to the problem. Many times we don't want other people to know what our problems are. It's got to be painful. I'm sure his eyes hurt. They have never opened before. But when we allow Jesus to touch us where it, where it is exactly the focal point of our, our hurt, that's when we begin to experience the miracle, the healing, the release. And what makes this phenomenal, and this is how I'm going to end this, is that Jesus now invites the man toward a journey of faith, toward a journey of healing, toward a journey of a miracle. And he says, I want you to participate with me in your healing. I want you to get up. And I want you to go to this pool named Shalom, which means scent. And I want you to bathe yourself. Bathe yourself in faith because I'm sending you and you'll be healed. Now, Jesus could have said, may your eyesight be restored. But Jesus is showing us the best way, not the better way or the good way, but the, but the best way to help other people activate their faith so they can see and experience the miracles of God. And that's what's missing today in the Christian's life, in your life, in my life, the entire body of Christ around the world. What's missing today is our experience with miracles God can do miracles. God wants to do miracles. God has open arms to all of us. 
and he wants to touch you where you need to be touched, and he wants you to touch others where they need to be touched, and he and everyone needs to be invited on this journey of faith so we can experience the work of God so that God gets all the glory. Are we ready for that? I am. I'm raising my hand. I'm I'm really I've read this. I, I'm blown away. I'm going to make my confession of faith so I, so I can be humble before God and say I am nowhere near I'm nowhere near what what this is all about. But I want to and I want to make the changes in my life. I want to make the changes in my life that I could truly deny myself carry my cross and follow Jesus and be exactly this kind of person. I don't know where it will lead me. I know it's hard to touch other people in their pain. I know it's very hard for me to be touched where it hurts me. But my friends, this is the only way to live the Christian life. This is the only way to live the Christian life. And if you're not, then you've got to question yourself if you're really a Christian. And if you are a Christian, maybe your sailboat has sailed off in the wrong direction and you, you need Jesus to come back and be your captain. Let's pray. Father God, help us to be like Jesus. Help us to be like your son. Open our eyes to see that every single crisis, every single problem, every single pain in our life is an opportunity the manifestation of God, the, the power of God, the miracle of God, the blessing of God, the presence of God can be made can be made known and help us to realize that we don't have tomorrow. There is no tomorrow. That each of us have works to do, works of God to do before the night time comes. My friends, and troubling times are coming. Do not be do not do not underestimate what is ahead of us. And so this is a great opportunity, O oh Father, to do a chiropractic adjustment on us, for us to wake up and realize we're still in, in apostolic times. We all have spiritual gifts. We have Jesus living inside of us. We have the power of the Holy Spirit. Nothing is impossible. All things are possible with God if you believe. Do you believe? Of course you do. Well, if the Lord tarries, I hope to join it again tomorrow. Walk with the king. Walk with him. Talk with him. Ask him all the hard questions. And let him be your life coach. Let him be your mentor. Let him be your let him be your boss. Let him be your Lord. I like the disciples said, call him, make him master. In Jesus' name, amen.